Natalie Handel is a French-American poet and writer. Her work has appeared in Vanity Fair, Guernica Magazine, The Guardian, The New York Times, The Irish Times, among many others. Handel's rich, diverse, and innovative body of work reflects her own multicultural, multilingual, and multinational life. Uh, for her seventh and most recent collection of poetry, which is the topic of tonight's conversation, Life in a Country Album, Handel won the 2020 Palestinian Book Award. Natalie, it is so wonderful to have you at the library this evening. Thank you so much for being with us. Alice, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you so much, and thank you everyone for, for coming. So to get started, we had agreed that uh, you were going to kind of read uh, read an opening poem. So I'm going to go ahead and let you let you do that to sort okay. of set the scene. Okay. So I will, since we are in Paris virtually, uh, I will start with a poem from the French section, and the book starts with a quote from Jack Gilbert, which reads French has no word for home, and we have no word for strict pleasure from the forgotten dialect of the heart. Un western avec Gary Cooper. Il était beau. We were in the desert. We were holding hands. But he was not there, and I didn't exist. Or wait, he existed in full light, but I kept disappearing. Le cinéma, it keeps us on. But what can a cowboy do for a French woman? What does the desert do for lust? He sculpted stars on my breast while horses pass by, the telescreen misty with dust. There we were, me, him, and the distance. It's easy to disappear here. Pleasure isn't simple. I wanted red boots and he wouldn't speak French, but we allowed ourselves to be missed. Thank you, Natalie. So I guess my first question is, is why did you pick this poem and how does it kind of set up um, the collection, which is in many ways about your kind of Franco-American identity? Yes. Um, so I guess, Alice, I have to start from the, the collection, the, the title of the collection, really. Uh, mm -hmm. The title, Life in a Country Album. When I was growing up, there were so many books and paintings and les albums around. It was usually l'album d'or de la chanson française, Aznavour, Dassin, Léo Ferré. And these artworks were, these creations of art were sort of a country. Um, but then there was, there were also the, what we call the sacred albums. And in these sacred albums, they were really photos, photos of Bethlehemites. Uh, where I, my family comes from. And these Bethlehemites were exiled and displaced all over the world. And the photos was what we had. And these photos were testimonies. And although I could see myself in the faces in these pictures, I didn't know, I didn't know them. And, and we were, and of course at the time, uh, there wasn't this mode of communications. So these album became really important. And of course, as the ache was, was, was there and the distress never stops as we are looking in the news right now. Uh, and it's a very difficult moment and we keep hearing diplomatic statements, but where's the action? Uh, I mean, how many, how many people should die? Uh, uh, what else is there to bomb in Gaza? They've been, Buried, they buried that place in the people. It's like it's like killing the dead. So these albums were sacred testament, uh, testaments. And uh, then I moved to New York City right after 9-11. And it was a huge, as you know, turning point in the US and in the world. And then I became American on the day Barack Obama became president of the United States. So you can imagine what New York City was like on that day and really what um, the world was feeling. And I was becoming American on that day. And uh, then I got a Lennon Foundation Fellowship in Marfa, Texas. And Texas, to come to the poem I just read, this is mm -hmm. the desert. And I know the desert intimately. And it 
but in this case, because I was in Texas, I was, you know, uh, I had all these Americana images that came to mind, John Wayne, the Cowboys. And I started realizing that they had different, these images had different meanings to me, that I understood them and knew them quite differently, right? Mm -hmm. uh, there was also a bar there that would play country music, many of which were wonderful ballads. Mm -hmm. So the title was born from that intersection between, for Americans, when they read the title, oftentimes the immediate association is country music. But mm -hmm. to most of the people in my life, a country was associated with exile, migration, displacement, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And yeah, this is, mm -hmm, go ahead. I, well, I just, I just wanted to say, you know, you had, you had read, you had read Jack Gilbert's um, epigraph and I had looked up, you know, where the poem from which it came. And I actually wanted to read the, the kind of few lines before the epigraph, because I think it's very telling and precisely to your point about the kind of slipperiness of language. So he writes, and, and the poem is The Forgotten Dialect of the Heart, as you, as you note in the collection. How astonishing is it that language can almost mean and frightening that it does not quite. Love we say, God we say, Rome and Michiko we say, and the words get it all wrong. We say bread and it means according to which nation. So I think this is exactly to your, exactly. To your point. Oh, thank you for reading that, thank you. No, it's yeah. lovely. And then again, you know, so French has no word for home and we have no word for strict pleasure. Yes. So we, 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 we go to music and poetry is music and music is so often in, in my body of work as a, a personage or as a shadow, uh, music migrates, right? Mm -hmm. and as I say in my poem, uh, Orphic, music always takes us back to the cities we are made from. Mm. So uh, these different, so these different albums, you know, they they bleed into each other because I experienced these cultures as a togetherness. You know, they were sort of mm. intertwined. Uh, my Palestinian culture and my French culture and my American culture, and I start with and the Mediterranean, of course, and I start with with the French album, mm. which explores what it means to be French. Uh, yes, yeah, so let's. Let's start, let's start with the French album. So it's called Bleu, Blanc, Rouge. And can yes. you say, um, can you explain kind of where that, where that comes from, um, where you pulled that from? And, um, and let's talk about the first poem, Le Chemin Lumière. Yeah, well. Le Chemin Lumière, uh, yes. Well, Bleu, Blanc, Rouge, uh, you know, France. And uh, also there's a quote from, it starts with a quote from the uh, Congolese, his writer, it's from his novel. But first I wanna say that this, this, in this poem, this long poem, I'm thinking about many things. When I, when I, when I set out to write what it meant to be French, I thought, what, what is my experience? How, what does being French mean to me? And so just, I, just quickly, when, when did you move to France? I mean, so you were born in Bethlehem. Well. Um, I, I was actually born in the Caribbean, but uh, oh, that, oh, that's why that, that yes, uh, the experience that's that's why this experience of Frenchness is so multiple because um, I experienced oh, French. Me. Yeah, I, I yeah, I was I experienced Frenchness inside and outside of France. Wow. You know, in France, my cities I consider my cities Paris and Marseille because yeah. in Paris it's where I became a woman it's where I learned the language of sensuality it's also where my literary life started and it's where my family's meeting point it's my family it's the city where my family meets and my family is scattered all over the world and Marseille is where I encountered my Mediterraneanness. you know uh, the sea is where all is conversing and I I come from that sea so both of these uh, both of these places, it, cities speak loudly to where I belong. And Paris is also, Paris reflects, you know, my urbanness. I'm, I'm, I'm a city, I, I'm a city, I'm a, very much from the city. And Marseille is what I call the, my sonata because the sea is my ancestry, you know? Um, and then there's the France that filtered through me via colonial histories, like in Haiti, where I was born, or linguistic connections, like in Switzerland, where I was conceived. And of course, many Bethlehemites at the time 
uh, my family, they had been educated in the schools around Bethlehem, which were uh, often in French and in Arabic, right? Mm. So it's it's a complicated it's a complicated history when you have one with the empire, right? The, <laughs> uh, yeah, but but for Paris, uh, I I always think of that city as another lifetime because every gesture is is sublime. It's like a sublime flame and it's inflaming. This is how I, I experience okay. Paris, right? Okay. Yeah, uh, yeah. And, yeah. And, so and within- take, hmm? Sorry, take us to the poem. Take us to the poem and and I, I, I mean, as, as somebody who moved to France only a year ago, I think I can very much relate to, to this. Are you French yet? Are you French yet? <laughs> Are you French yet? Yes, it, it, we, keep, we keep asking that question. So, uh, but you know, I, I kept asking, are you French? And also the question of language, which uh, I suppose we'll <laughs> talk about uh, is also very important, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know if you wanted me to read a specific section, but- oh, it, Can you just, I, I would love for you to read the kind of opening, um, the opening epigraph of, of the poem, you know, we admired his speaking style. We admire, uh, oh, you mean the, the yeah, yeah. Alain Mamouk, yes. So yeah. from, this is from his book, Bleu, Blanc, Rouge, and it reads, we, quote, we admired his speaking style. He spoke French, French, the famous French of Guy de Maupassant. He, he didn't speak real French what we considered to be French with our rustic accent, a jerky accent, the French of a former little black soldier. There's a big difference between speaking in French and speaking French, he claimed, without developing his point. There's a lot there, there's a lot there. And this, and this takes us to uh, colonial uh, histories, right? Mm -hmm. Which are really, really very important. And, uh, and but, you know, in Paris, in this Paris section, there is also the, the album Arabe à Paris, which maybe should have been called the Palestinian album in Paris, because it was where I met very important uh, people, literary figures that were, important in my life, such as the Syrian critic uh, Subhi Hadidi, and that's where I also met the Palestinian poet uh, Mahmoud Darwish, mm -hmm. and who, who was fundamental to, who's fundamental to world literature, who's fundamental, of course, to Palestine, and he, uh, he lived in, uh, on, in Place des Etats-Unis, this is where he lived, and of course, this became sort of interesting later on as I was writing the book. And uh, he also gave me my first writing assignment ever, which was to interview Allen Ginsberg. <laughs> so um, there are many layers to this uh, Paris, uh, Paris experience, right? Mm -hmm. But just on the level, let's, on the level of language, mm -hmm. um, you, you write, um, well, this is the start of the poem. While the city stood between uneven lights, I slid away as if I didn't belong to its questions, as if French wasn't mine, even if it's the first language I used to conjugate love. Mm. Yes, uh, you know, I, I grew up with a symphony of languages. Uh, mm. And each of these languages were, they're, they're within each of these languages, there were was a mix of multiple dialects and accents. So as you can imagine, uh, it, 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 has, it had its own dynamics. So although French was the first language uh, I heard and where of course I imagine love was expressed to me as a child, what I really remember as my mother tongue is this, this symphony of languages put mm. together, which became my language. Mm. And so French, English, you know, all these languages that were uh, in, in the Bethlehem and, and in the diaspora, which was French, mm -hmm. Arabic, English, Spanish, Haitian, Creole, Italian, Greek, Armenian, <laughs> these were important. And, you know, they're all part of a, 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 a culture uh, of a Mediterranean, you know, the Mediterranean, when we 
to look at the Mediterranean is very interesting. And I mm. very much, I feel very, I identify as, as very much a Mediterranean because although everywhere I go, whether it's from Asia to Latin America, I feel I belong somehow, despite the fact that otherness was always present. Uh, the Mediterranean is where cultural, religious, linguistic diversity converge. It's where our ideas travel, intersect. You know, the Mediterranean trades, it's, we're navigators and interpreters. Our ling lingua franca is the sea, right? Uh, a language born, in sort of a mix of tongues. And I see myself in those crossroads, right? And, uh, and so- yeah, that, That's lovely. And, and in some sense that um, it transcends borders. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think we have to remember, especially in when today, as we speak so much about migrations and in Europe, of course, migrations coming from Asia, from the Middle East here, we have to remember what, 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 what does the Mediterranean Sea has to offer us in relationship to coexistence and conversation, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, I, I can't imagine life without a city like Rome. I mean, such a disobedient city, you know, in, in, Chaos perfetto, you know, the, the perfect chaos, or, or Venice or Naples, the Saloniki, mm -hmm. and there's too many to name, but they mm -hmm. are part of my personal history, past and present. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just, I, I guess what I want to stay on, because in, in the collection, so, so we're starting with the, the first poem, Chemin Lumière, and so this is kind of you meeting the French language, probably, you know, in France for the first time, and, and feeling a sense of well, I thought I knew French, but here maybe some French people are telling me that I don't know the French French and what is French French because I, I speak French and I understand French. Um, but there are other, there are many other languages um, that you use in the collection. And I wonder, um, at, you know, why use all these different languages and then what, which, which languages kind of, what does each language afford you mm. as it were? You know, you really can't, uh, I can't really uh, choose between one or the other because with every language, it's a world and all these languages are actually conversing with each other. You know, right. my, the, uh, what I meant by the French is that there are so many ways to speak French, right? You, you have yeah. many different Frenches as there are many different Englishes, as there are many different Spanishes, many different Italians, right? And these, so all these dialects and accents but when you are an aspiring writer <laughs> trying to find a literary home, this is when it becomes something you have to think about because mm -hmm. do your words need a country? And this was a question I had to ask myself. And that's where it's not so much that, uh, I always felt home in French, but it, I went to international schools. Mm -hmm. And so the poetry came to me in English. It, mm. but the music of the French and of course the way I use a syntax and, and rhythm and they, they are influenced by all these other languages right mm. Uh, mm. Uh, Spanish uh, now for example listening so much to Italian or or mm. uh, Arabic the, this this is inter in, it's weaved in and one of the things about American English per se was that you know uh, and to this I owe everything everything to New York City, because New York City taught me, New York City is really the drum, New York City taught me how to fuse all those different languages and culture within the American English, because mm -hmm. what is American, I mean, we can speak in, uh, uh, in the United States, depending on where you're at, and it's a country of immigrants, so we have uh, you're you're able to fuse in that way, and of course, in in minds it was plural. It wasn't just you know it's Spanglish or two languages. It's many languages that come together mm -hmm. and unite on the page. And so uh, they're all important, and they're all conversing with each other in very specific ways. You know. Yeah, and you had said kind of before before the the event that you you found a literary home in America too. I, that was extremely important to me. Coming from a very exilic reality as a Bethlehemite, eh, I, you know, belonging, as, as I mentioned, as myself, Natalie, I felt I could connect to so many different places. 
places. But there was another reality, right? There's the passport you hold, there's the name, that there's your name, there's all the questions that you're asked. What is your origin? What is your ethnicity? You're constantly asked and you're constantly <laughs> being told, you, sh you know, and you're constantly being defined by the gaze of the other as well. And in the beginning it was frustrating, but then later on that gaze became quite informative for me about what the world, you know, how, how the world, what was the world thinking about certain things? What was that about? So I became, I decided I would listen. The act of listening became extremely important, right? Mm -hmm. And so uh, I, but for my writing life, that was fundamental for me. And I knew that, uh, you know, America was the space for me to, to to be an American writer, although of course I am as a Palestinian, I'm part of Palestinian literature because Palestinian mm -hmm. literature today comes from uh, many languages. It's not only Arabic because due to the history of the Palestinian issue, mm -hmm. but having this American home in this language and being able as well to carry all those other places that are also part of me because mm -hmm. they are part, they're fundamental parts as well of my of who I have become, you know, my gaze in the world, uh, mm -hmm. how I translate the world, how I translate myself, how I see myself in these contexts, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I read an interview or I heard an interview with you today and you said that in many senses, you know, you're creating your own language and through this act of creation, it's also an act of definition. You said this is who we are this is how we define ourselves can you speak a little bit about how you define yourself through the creation of your own language by weaving all these languages together you know i what what i can say about that is it's it, poetry you know poetry is uh, the most democratic place i know it's the place that i am the freest yeah. Because with poetry, you can, first of all, I can be everywhere and with everyone I love at mm -hmm. once, which is mm -hmm. a really powerful experience. Yeah. And I can also allow all these different cultures, languages, mm -hmm. and places to also be together. And oftentimes, you know, we have all these divisions and borders that don't allow us. And yet, uh, in a poem that's able to exist, it's a very powerful, it's a very powerful experience to to have that and what what do you think what is it about the form of poetry unlike prose that allows for that freedom uh i think you know poetry takes us poetry is a form of prayer it's the closest thing we have to what's divine and it it takes us closest to our humanity i think more than any other um you know obviously we can transcend many things as well when we're writing prose. But I think poetry has, has that extra uh, power, uh, this sort of mysteriousness that uh, allows for more breathing space for people mm -hmm. to enter, right, in, in, at different mm -hmm. angles. Mm -mm. And so, so you quote. I mean, your this. Um, friend, I wish I had. A, I wish I could hold it up, but I, I don't have. A, I only have the PDF copy. But um, you intersperse many kind of poetic voices um, into the collection. You know, Emily Dickinson um, and, and you know, the epigraph that we mentioned earlier, Jack Gilbert. But who? I, I'm curious, um, Natalie. When you were younger, who were the kind of poets that you were reading um, as you were kind of becoming a poet? <laughs> well, of course, uh, there were all the French, there was a lot of French poets and there was a lot of French writers. Bonjour Tristesse was such an important book when I read uh, Mahmoud Darwish, I always go back to, we were, we were a, a, really a house of books. <laughs> so there was a lot of literature, there was a lot of conversations, I, I you know, Lorca, Lorca is a, an important poet to me. I wrote a whole book dedicated on the recreation of Lorca's journey in reverse from poet in New York with poet in mm -hmm. Andalusia. We, re I read quite, uh, and later on, 
the American, the, the American poets like um, uh, Audre Lorde, African-American women poets became fundamental to me. Mm -hmm. But I discovered that much later, especially because when I actually went to the US, I, I realized how much we don't know about American literature. And that was a, a new beginning, a very fierce and interesting, uh, uh, life-changing really, because there's there were stories stories and voices that were speaking to an experience I knew that I had not read before. So although I had someone like, for instance, Mahmoud Darwish, and there were other uh, poets that spoke of, of war or conflict, not until I got to the, you, most of the poets we were, we were reading and writers we were reading were coming from empires. And mm -hmm. suddenly we were given a literature where we were reading uh, uh, African American voices and and other voices uh, of people of color, and that really shifted everything and how I saw myself in the world and what I could create on the page. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah, you you had described poetry in another interview as um, a revolutionary act. Yes, you know, as much as a, as a creation of fruit. Can you describe this kind of your understanding of poetry as as a revolutionary act, as a radical act, even? Yes, I, you know, I think poetry shows me how to see freedom, how to arrive to the world in my poems. And I think it's, it, you know, it can, poetry witnesses and it, it can move our mind and heart so monumentally that we can, we can reverse fear and discrimination. What's most powerful to me in poetry is it's, all, it's on the side of truth. Poetry is on the side of truth. Mm. What do you mean by that? Okay, you have to just take the phrase. <laughs> it's un interpreted that, you know, it's, 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 it's the closest we, for me, I'll say, whoever's listening out there, you can define it as you want, what I've just said, what truth, because then we have to define what is truth, right? Mm -hmm. And so we can, we can, we'll, we'll, as you know, we'll, we'll ask question after question. But I suppose for me, truth, circles back to what I spoke earlier, which is something divine, something mysterious, mm -hmm. something powerful, and something mm -hmm. raw and essential. And that you can't, you can't, you can't mythologize that. Mm -hmm. you, know, you can't mythologize love. You can create uh, historical myths, you can create, you know, all kinds of, but, but there are certain things that uh, remain as close to uh, what's divine and pure. If I could mm. say it that way. Mm -hmm. Lovely. Um, I just want to kind of bring us back to to this sense of the the five pieces of this collection. Oh yes. So how, yes. So, so um, how did the kind of the five? So you have the the album français, then the album Arabe à Paris, the Mediterranean album, the American album, and then finally the album mixed. Right. How did you kind of come up with these five sections of the collection? And, um, and the order, and then what, can you tell the audience a little bit about the album mix? <laughs> yes, so, you know, it's, it sort of starts with uh, France because that's my starting point. And that bleeds into my uh, Palestine, of course. And I wanna say, I mean, in this book in particular, because mm -hmm. I, in all my books, I am trying to build a geography of people and places because mm -hmm. that has been my experience. Mm -hmm. So every book sort of speaks to uh, different places, although you know there are appearances of all of these places in each book, but I'm, I'm specifically conversing to a certain place. And in this specific book, it was my American, and my French and American uh, identities, which are two empires. Mm -hmm. And what did that mean coming from where I came from, right? So mm -hmm. I started with France and in the middle, there was the, 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 the Mediterranean because we are in the Mediterranean, right? A part of France is in the Mediterranean. Mm -hmm. And then it goes into the US because I became American later on. And then it circles back to the mix album, which is, as you know, just it's one poem. And it, it asks in this poem, how do we live together? 
How do we exist together? And I wanted to leave with, I wanted to end with a hopeful note. And the title, Elefteria, mm -hmm. for from the Greek word freedom, mm -hmm. is how I left the collection. Uh, and uh, yeah, and maybe I when I use the word mix, I mean the word mix is many different, uh, it, it alludes to, to fusion, it alludes to coexistence, it alludes to empathy, to compassion, mm -hmm. uh, to uh, coming together, you know, mm -hmm. that, that, that was sort of the idea. Mm -hmm. No, it's absolutely lovely. And, and the textures of all of these places, as you say, you know, it's not only, we've talked a lot, a lot about language, but there are characters, there is sensory, you know, you excerpt news fragments and, and kind of explanations at the bottom. So can you talk about the kind of intertextuality also of the collection, the sense that it's not only beautiful lyrical writing because it is, but you really, there's a really a sense that you're kind of, it's an immersive experience, I would say, reading some of these poems. Thank you for saying that. I, you know, I, when you, what you're speaking about in these layers, I, I've also, because uh, I spent my life translating myself, and I have to say that there's two of my translators in the audience, two very important people to me, Martha, Marta, who translated my collection, she, her, she's gone, I don't know if she, she can still hear, but she's translated my collection into Italian and it, it's very a very interesting uh, relationship that you have with someone who translates you and then Samira who is uh, Samira has just translated my collection Mar Marta translated the lives of rain and Samira mm -hmm. translated love and strange horses which will appear in French from a publishing house uh, in Montréal, uh, Mémoire d'Ancrier. And Samira and I and Marta, we've spoken a lot, but on this idea of conversing with culture. And I remember meeting uh, Samira for the first time at, uh, in France, in Le Dev, there was a poetry festival, Poésie de la Méditerranée. And we immediately could, there was, there was an immediate uh, connection, uh, not only poetically and culturally, but it was all the, in all the silences in between. The things mm -hmm. that we, I couldn't say she was able to, to say for me and vice versa. And I think the same sort of relationship that you can meet if you're lucky enough with a translator. Uh, I, I also, uh, do this uh, on my own with my own text when I'm writing in English, which mm -hmm. is another experience. But, you know, uh, so they're feeding the experiences with your the translators and your experience with yourself alone is very interesting because they are also conversing with each other. These translators mm -hmm. are teaching me even how to translate my own self. And when I say this, I, I'm talking about translations of culture, translations of emotions, translation, mm -hmm. all sorts of different translations, because we express emotions and love uh, in, in different ways in every language and in every culture. And, and, mm -hmm. and some it's, you know, so these are, so how then do you uh, express that on the page in a completely different language and in a completely different culture, which is the American <laughs> English. Right, so. right, right. I wanna go back to this notion of silence because you were talking about it uh, kind of before the event, you know, so you won the Palestinian Book Award yes. for this collection. And you had mentioned that when you won it, they were kind of pushing you to say, well, where is, where is the Palestinian? In, in, can, you, can you speak to this a wonderful kind of remark? Yes, well, I, of course, I was very, it was very important for me that I won that specific prize. Uh, the committee, of course, saw this, but there was one, com so one person who commented on uh, the Palestinian aspect of the book and only concentrated on the middle section, you know, the, uh, the, the, the Arab uh, section where I conversed with Mahmoud Darwish. But actually, the the Palestine experience is all over this mm. book because I've had extremely global experience 
I am a global person, but it starts from the fact that I was exiled from Bethlehem, mm -hmm. right? It starts mm -hmm. from that. So all those other things would not exist. Mm -hmm. So the, 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 the heart of the poems has, uh, has, has, has Palestine and has Bethlehem, even if, of course, those other places uh, are played fundamental roles. Yeah. Yeah, and I think you were kind of saying, you know, do I have to say it explicitly to say it? Exactly. I mean, what and is the role of Right. We, 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 it's all, as poetry is, it's all about the beats, the music of the heart. That's where it is. This is where something lives deepest, right? So mm -hmm. we don't need to name something, right? So... Mm -hmm. Lovely. Well, I want to encourage um, anyone who has a question for Natalie to please go ahead and post, begin to post your questions and I will um, start to moderate the chat um, and even comments, you know, we, if you if you want to hear more about a particular part of the discussion. And if you've just arrived, um, for any latecomers, you have stumbled in on a wonderful um, and moving discussion of Natalie Handel's latest collection of poetry, um, Life in a Country album. It's her seventh and um, we are discussing it. So I will wait for your questions and I will continue to ask my own until I receive, <laughs> until I receive them. Um, and you know, Alice, I wanted to say that for, for, for to just to come back to New York because it's yeah. such an important, and since we're talking about these translations and, and, mm -hmm. and the, 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 the New York is a city, I live in Queens. It's the most diverse place in the nation. And yeah. I have a poem in the book on the seven where it, these small prose poems, which take us to different communities on the seven trays, which we call the International Express. Mm -hmm. And it, you'll go to, you, you know, you'll go to Ch China and India and Pakistan and Ireland. It's, it's an incredible place. And the, I don't think I could have possibly understood my co complexities had I not moved to New York City. Mm -hmm. Had I not been on the subway, and I'm a big fan of the MTA. Uh, <laughs> New Yorkers complain about it, but I'm a big fan. You, I, I was just about to say, you might be the only person to have ever said that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm, a huge, I'm a huge fan, and I, I love being, I've read so many books and written so many poems in my head on the subway. Really? And, just being with the world in mm. one part is an is extraordinary to mm. me you and, haven't done that elsewhere and not to that to that extent no it's it's there's there's only new york that has so it's it's the most diverse place that uh, uh it's the most diverse place mm. and i remember one of the most extraordinary things that happened uh, was you know the mt they have there's a program poetry in motion and poems are put on the subway. And when they chose my poem, Lady Liberty, it's, and, and to have chosen that poem specifically, which is of course linked to okay, Liberty, all my titles, right? Uh, France, America, and for it to be in, on the subway where 7 million you know, uh, uh, commuters can mm -hmm. read it a day, it was so extraordinary to be in communion with the city like that and to be seen in transit. Because mm. for me, home has been so much in transit, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a lot. What a lovely image. The sense of your poem being carried along, surrounded by all of these different nationalities. Yeah. Um, actually, Kat, Kathy had, had already pointed out that there was a poem of yours sponsored on the MTA. And then someone. Oh, Kathy. Kathy. Kathy is an extraordinary. Kathy. Oh. Well, I can't, I, I, I can't read, you'll have to read and I, as the- Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then we had a, we had a, a funny comment from Ali who said, you have a lot of time to write on the seven train because of the endless delays. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, you're being harsh. But I, I want to mention Kathy. Kathy is one of the most, Kathy has been fundamental in my life, an extraordinary mm -hmm. poet and um, who, who has, uh, who was really fought so much for 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 freedom as well in her work? What did she say? Sponsored by the, oh, she said that, uh, and 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 who has taught me a tremendous amount 
on what uh, what what poetry is because she herself uh, is a poem. She carries that same uh, generosity that mm -hmm. poetry does, mm -hmm. Kathy. Kathy. Oh. Thank you for coming, Kathy. Uh, so happy to see you. Marta, you were there when I was speaking to you, but you had disappeared from the screen. Oh. <laughs> um, we had it. We had just a cut. This is kind of a more, uh, more a simpler question, but I guess some people had missed it. And so, just just to be precise here, Natalie, what was your first language? Um, was it multiple? And um, what language do you primarily write in? Okay, so, that, so that's that's a question from uh, Margot, and then there was that was the also question of uh, yeah. uh, Damarias. Okay, thank you so much for your questions. Yeah. Uh, I I suppose technically you could say French was the first language I heard, except I heard this as a child. So really, I always say I don't have a mother tongue. That I come from a symphony of tongues because mm -hmm. what I remember as language is that symphony. Mm -hmm. I remember hearing all these languages being spoken at the same time mm -hmm. and everybody just sort of answering in the language they felt most comfortable in. So I would say my native tongue is the symphony of these languages. Mm -hmm. uh, and later on, because I went to international school, we English, of course, was very present. I then, and actually the poetry came to me in English. The English that I had before I moved to New York was extremely accented, meaning it was, uh, I don't know that I could, I didn't know that I could do what I could in English. And then really it became for the, for, you know, we talked about this earlier in relationship to bringing all these cultures into a, the, the American English that allowed me that space. And so I worked that English. Mm. Uh, and it's funny, there was a, uh, a test in the New York Times recently. I'm forgetting it's it, the upshot, I think the section and this test, you could take it and it could tell you where in the United States you were from, right? So I, did you see that Lily? Oh, Lily, Lily. Uh, and, and this test, I took it. And so uh, the dots went, uh, to New York City and Patterson, New Jersey. And I said, it's okay, maybe I got influenced by the Italian Americans. And, and so I was really happy because it was like sort of in the New York area. And mm -hmm. then I sent it to my friend and she told me, oh, you're, I sent her my results. And she said, oh, you're, you're, um, you are all of America, but especially New York. And I'm like, what do you mean? And then she showed me that it, there was, you, there was sort of a de degradation between uh, most similar to to uh, least, and so my chart was sort of all over. But then it was it was a little bit most in New York, and I just told her, "Come on, New York City, that's it." <laughs> but uh, so that was that that was very interesting, and I and obviously after twenty years, my English is different than what it was when I first started. Right? <laughs> How has it changed? <laughs> completely. I, I don't think I spoke English in this. I didn't know the English language in the same way that I know it. It, it I worked also much harder probably than, and now I can, you know, edit American text. I'm a professor because you, you work so much harder to know everything, you mm -hmm. know, and, you know, to, to know the rules, to then be able to break them, to mm -hmm. be able to do new things with mm -hmm. the language, you had to really be intimate. Mm -hmm. So it's a language in which I, uh, it's the language in which I'm the most intimate in that, in that way on the page. Mm -hmm. And someone asked if I write in other languages. No, I, I, I possibly could write a text, but it's, it's, I, I don't, but those other languages are definitely present in mm -hmm. my English text. Mm -hmm. We have a great question from Mark. I'm going to just read it out in its entirety. He says, you use many different poetic forms, but I find that your prose poems from this book and the Republics have a specific feel to them, for lack of a better word, which I find so energizing. Do you find in the writing process that you know you're going to work in a particular form like prose poems, or do you sort this out in revisions? Mm, thank you, Mark. Hi, Mark. Uh, how are you? Hi, Mark. Uh, uh, I, it, 
I don't know uh, that. No, Mark, I, I think it just comes Mark out. Mark is in Poland. Yes, he's in Poland. <laughs> yes. Mark is a wonderful, I, I featured Mark in my, I've written a column for 10 years uh, for Words Without Borders, the city and the writer, and, and writers speak about their cities and Mark was featured. So please go read, you can mm -hmm. read this piece. But Mark, I, I, I don't, I think uh, it, it, sometimes it wants to be said in a more prosaic narrative voice and other times it comes out lyrical. So I, I don't think I set out to, to uh, write it in a specific form. Sometimes you, you, don't, you actually don't, you, you experiment with form on the page, like you let it come out and then you realize, oh, this is meant to be in, in prose form. That's how mm -hmm. I see it. And when I was doing the, the poem that you, you mentioned on the seven, it was, first of all, it had this more narrative uh, feel, but also it was like the carts, like the New York City carts. So it, it had to be in that form. Mm. Sometimes when we look at the page, I tend to think also of the, the blueprint, like an architect on the page, right? Mm. If we look at the page, the empty spaces are also speaking to the poem. Everything is in relationship to the words. Right, so uh, later when you're editing, you sort of uh, look at the form and decide upon it. So sometimes it comes out immediately as it wants to, and then other times it's asking you to find a better shape for it. Yeah, so Mark, Mark had also commented on the empty space of your poem Aleppo. In, in, sorry, in what? Of your poem Aleppo. He, uh, he, he said that the uh, empty space of the page is oh. so intense in the context of that poem. Oh yes, of course. I mean, if we're thinking about Aleppo, if we're thinking about the situation, what else? It's, it's it, you know, a long silence seems to me. Uh, it's like a blackout on the page. Mm. Uh, that that it's, it's a it's a deep mourning, a mourning that when your mourning is so deep, you hold your breath. And that's, that's all that's left, two lines. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mark. Yeah. Um, Stella would like to know, what are you working on now? And we also had a question from Robert about, um, you know, maybe your responses to the Israel-Palestinian situation, you know, another moment to hold one's breath. Yes, uh, what am I working on now? I am working on a series of poems set in Sicily. It, it, I, as I had mentioned earlier, I wrote Poet in Andalusia, which was a recreation of Lorca's journey in reverse, but also Andalusia itself was a meeting place where we had, uh, you know, where Muslims and Jews and Christians, not, they created incredible art together. Uh, and I wanted to sort of visit uh, that period in Andalusia. And it's natural to then go to Sicily because Sicily, I mean, this is a meeting place. It's, it, convert, it, it, it meets with Africa, with Europe, with, uh, it, it's just an incredible place uh, mixed. And I am working on <laughs> these poems, but obviously right now we cannot travel and move and research as we are, as, 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 as you know, as we normally would. Mm -hmm. But uh, these are the poems that are, um, that are inhabiting me. And just really thinking about migrations, just really having a meditation on the sea uh this is this is what i'm working on at the moment mm -hmm. and uh as for what's happening in palestine and israel it, it, what else is there to say really uh action is needed mm -hmm. that how, how many more should die mm -hmm. uh, that's th that's where we're at do we need to see more does more have to happen 
before there's an actual action, uh, you know, there more bombing, more bombing where you're bombing the, you've already bombed the whole, Gaza has been bombed. And, you know, it's like, you're, it's like bombing the, the, the ruins and like re-killing the dead. Mm. So action is, action, action is important. And occupied East Jerusalem is one of the most devastating places I've, 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 I've known. And as a Bethlehemite who cannot go to Jerusalem, who, and Jerusalem is a sister city, it's seven miles away, you know? Mm. Uh, would you say, Natalie, that for you, action, you know, your action is to take to the page? My action, yes, of course. Uh, but the action I was speaking about was, of course. Oh, right, the, right. <laughs> uh, and to me, it's, you know, we, as, as, as artists and as, we, uh, as someone from the region, we have to, uh, you know, we, we, we give these human portraits that are not necessarily offered, you know, in the media, right? Uh, there's much that is not offered. And so I think uh, as a poet, I, I go to those stories and in the media, what we hear is this perspective and that perspective, mm. this point of view and that point of view. Mm. And I'm saying, I am a child of five years old mm. and I saw my father, um, I, 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 I saw one death after another. I saw nine children died. I lost my entire family. This is my story, mm. right? You, you can't really contest a human story. This is your human story. So to, to talk about these stories is to, you know, take us back to, to these uh, faces and names that we, we don't hear in the news. Mm, mm, mm. Um, I think this kind of gets to Michelle's question, um, which is about the importance of location for you in your work. And so Michelle asks, how much does your present locale uh, inform your work? Or do you conjure inspiration without influence from your current location? Or is it kind of after the fact of what's the relationship between location and your work? It, it's it's whether we want to or not location is is, is affecting us right uh, location location location, location yes. <laughs> i uh right now of course i'm in the paris rooftops but <laughs> really, really i am in rome and uh, and you know how how can i not be influenced by uh, uh being in a city like rome i mean the beats Mm -hmm. the, 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 the beauty of the city, the nature, uh, looking at, uh, it, it's, it's, it's all, so you, you, you might be, I might want to write about one thing, but then the nature and the place is, is pulling me towards it. So mm -hmm. sure, we are, we write about whatever it is we're writing, if I have to, 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 to write about, I don't know, Minneapolis, or whatever I'm meant to, to write about, I, I can go there as, a, as an artist. I can go there in my mind. But the location that you're in is still has a very strong pull and is asking you to, it's like a jealous lover. It's pulling you towards, you know, <laughs> pay attention to me, pay attention to me. So, so I think as artists, we're able to do that. We're able to go to the space that we need to go outside of the location that we're in. But that location definitely is conversing with to us in extremely important ways. I find myself writing so many poems about Rome, and uh, you know, as 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 I write about thinking about Sicily as I was working on the project, but I find I find a lot of the poems are about Rome. Mm. So you know, it's okay. You let it come. Mm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, this is also a kind of a question about your process, and this will be the last question. And then anyone else? We had a question from Gus and also Marta, but I encourage. Gus and Martin, anyone else whose comment or question I didn't get to, Donna, um, really anyone else, please do stay on for the virtual reception because you can ask Natalie your questions um, yourself, which is which is much, much better than me saying them on your behalf. Um, so Isaiah wants to know, 
Um, the imagery in your poetry is so unique and inspiring. Do you build poems around these images from the start or is it closer to a stream of thought kind of process? He writes, I love reading your work, smiley face. Oh, thank <laughs> you so much, Isaiah. Thank you, thank you. I, I'm a very visual person and I, I, I see a lot of details and uh, I'm, my eyes are constantly, that's why, you know, imagine being in a city like Rome or even when we're in New York City, you're, you're, you're going to all these uh, images. And as a poet, I'm in love with words. Uh, all, all kinds, you know, I, I, I see, I, I, I meet words uh, in other languages. I meet them. I have conversations with these words. I try to to know what they mean in at, in in different ways. So I don't think I think it comes out naturally because I have a bank of images <laughs> and words inside of me that I collect. I I sort of naturally collect them, and then when I'm writing, they come out. But they are not necessarily associated. It could have been a word that I found in uh, uh, Malaga and then an image that I found in Iowa, really. Mm -hmm. You don't know how you associate these images and these words, mm -hmm. but you kind of, your body has kind of collected them, right? Because mm -hmm. as poets, I think we're just a body of ruins, right? Our bodies <laughs> have these ruins, you know? And mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Isaiah, thank you. Lovely. So I'm looking at the looking at the clock, and we had decided, Natty, that you would read. Um, you selected a poem to read at the end, just to kind of round off the discussion. Um, so please go ahead and, and read that. And I just I just um, wanted to post the link to um, the link that will take you to the place where you can buy Natalie's collection of poems. If tonight's conversation hasn't um, inspired and encouraged you enough. I really, really strongly urge you to go out and order it. It is such a beautiful and moving um, and a profound experience. And you can just keep going back and dipping in and dipping out. So. Thank you, Alice. Thank you for saying that. Thank you so much. I'm going to end with a po the poem Orphic. As a child, I believe God was in the wind that carried us elsewhere, that departures were returns. I buried the sun in my father's ashtray to see him in eyes in Berlin or Stockholm, where the cold is another country, longing another landscape. And the past comes back. Close the door. Solitude will not leave. Close the window. Light will not escape. Close the wooden trunk. Memory will not vanish. Close your eyes, home will not disappear. Close everything close, all will remain like Mostar and Jerusalem, like our Roman chants, Byzantium icons, Muslim prayers. The years passed. I looked for death in Palermo and found my mother's womb. Looked for life in Thessaloniki, and found a song about death. Looked for my image in Venice and found all my images. Crossed Trieste with my heart and Naples without my hesitations. Memorized Marseille from Notre Dame de la Garde. Counted all my dreams in Acca. Found my name in the Colosseum. Listened to the lemons fall for hours in Rome waited for my lover to tell me the sea can't break and found the musician born in a small town that reminded me that music always takes us back to the cities we are made from. Merci. Thank you.